Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I will be your host for today's online conference. A couple of announcements as we get things started. Our online conference today is sponsored by Microsoft, and we would like to say a big thank you to them. Is big data for everyone? Big data is generating a lot of interest, but the barriers to entry prevent a broader base of users from unlocking its potential. Microsoft is democratizing big data for the masses, delivering insights through familiar tools like Excel, offering an enriched data with a central data marketplace, and providing manageability with enterprise-ready Hadoop distributions. For more information, please visit www.microsoft.com slash big data. I will turn the program over to Alistair Kroll for his opening comments in just a moment. But first, I'd like to go over some housekeeping things to help you get the most out of today's online conference. Please open the group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for today's speakers. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for the speakers, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that it's for them and we can make sure they see it for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you would like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you'll need to give it permission to access your account. Our hashtag today is StratacONF, all one word, and the Twitter widget will automatically append it to your tweets so you don't have to. If you have any problems during the event, please take a look at the help widget. If you continue to have problems, please post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know. We are recording today's online conference and we'll have an archive ready, usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Alistair Cole. Hello, Alistair. Good morning, Isvina, and thank you for the intro. And uh, hello to everybody uh, logging in and uh, joining us around the world. Uh, we've got an interesting lineup this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we're going to spend some time looking at uh, some of the highlights of what's going to be happening later on this month uh, in New York as part of O'Reilly's Strata Conference. Uh, O'Reilly runs a conference uh, on the East and West Coasts, as many of you probably know. Uh, and the next one's coming up October 23rd to 25th. Um, everything tells me it's going to be huge. We've um, teamed up with the Hadoop World folks, and we've got a, an amazing lineup of content. Um, Strata is actually focused not just on things like big data, but also on uh, new interfaces and ubiquitous computing and how all of that is changing the world. And it's a pretty exciting place. And we've asked a few of the presenters to uh, join us today and give you an overview of what they're going to be talking about and talk about some of the highlights. Um, it's an interesting cross-section of speakers. Before we get into that, though, I want to make some uh, observations about what we've seen in the last year. Uh, a few years ago, when the word cloud computing emerged on the IT landscape, uh, it meant something. And then it became a branding term for a little while, and that ne wasn't necessarily a good thing. It caused a lot of confusion in the market, uh, a lot of people put on the mantle of the cloud and tried to improve the way they looked. And uh, the same thing is happening to the narrow term big data. Um, for a lot of people, you know, the internet has a lot of data, therefore everything's on the internet, therefore everything's big. Uh, and we're trying really hard to have a more um, nuanced discussion about what big data means. For us, we actually think that in some ways, the more boring big data is, the better it is for it to become a truly game-changing set of technologies because um, what we're seeing more and more of is that uh, despite all the hype, uh, there are sort of quiet soldiers behind the Fortune 500 lines gradually moving traditional BI and data warehousing applications to um, frameworks and platforms like Hadoop. And that's um, making this stuff much more usable in a practical manner. So more and more of the stories that we're hearing um, are around uh, ways that data is fixing existing process. In other words, an evolutionary change, not a revolutionary change. Coupled with that is the fact that the cost of big data 
um, has really drop, dropped dramatically. Uh, once upon a time, if you wanted to build a data storage environment, uh, you probably had to pick and choose between any two of the three characteristics of a database. Uh, traditionally, you could have a database that was really fast, a database that was really big, or a database that had a tremendous amount of variety. And really, you were forced to pick two out of three because the cost of getting all three was prohibitive. And it's that central cost that's dropped dramatically, partly because of cloud computing, partly because of Moore's law, partly because of algorithmic advances. Um, but that that particular triangle has um, has become much more affordable. And um, one of the most amazing things that happens when something gets affordable is we find new ways to use it. So we aren't just applying it for uh, traditional uh, intelligence gathering or uh, for CRM optimization. We're applying it to things like uh, figuring out where you should eat dinner or uh, who your friends are. And this is what happens when something becomes cheap and abundant. We saw it when steam power became abundant, uh, that people found new ways of using steam. And uh, my co-chair, Ed, has said that data is the new oil. I think the big difference there is that in this case, uh, data is abundant, whereas oil is scarce. And so when things become abundant, we find new ways of using them. And it really is those new ways of using them, many of which seem kind of mundane, but are actually transformative, um, that I'm excited about for Strata in the coming um, months. And that's really what we're gonna be touching on um, as we come together in New York later on this month. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first of several speakers we have. Um, we tried to bring together a number of different topics to look at, um, and I think uh, big data is playing out in lots of traditional marketplaces. Uh, Stan Humphreys has joined us from Zillow, and he's going to talk to us about um, how data is disrupting the real estate market. Stan? Hi, Alistair. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking with everyone today. Um, I, what I wanted to try to achieve today was give a little bit of a preview of what I'm going to be speaking about in more depth uh, later on this month. Um, so generally, I'm going to be um, speaking about the what we've tried to do in, with using big data here at Zillow um, and the purpose for which we've, we, we're have we utilizing big data, and then describe a little bit behind the scenes kind of the technical infrastructure and different how we've evolved from really 2005 to today in terms of the infrastructure and how we approach uh, uh, big data and, and the systems we're using to manipulate it. Um, so bringing up my first slide. Um, um, what, what, we're, what we've tried to do is here at Zillow, we're interested in creating the um, creating the largest real estate marketplace for, for information out there so that we can be able to help consumers that are interested in anything really related to real estate ultimately. So that's buyers and sellers and renters, um, homeowners who might be interested in, uh, even if they're interested in buying and selling their homes, they might be interested in understanding how much equity, equity they have in their house, um, you know, a variety of different things. We want Zillow to be a resource to help them understand everything having to do with that. And uh, generally back in 2005 when we started this enterprise, the state of the world was such that uh, this information was, was out there, but it was generally squirreled away in a lot of different systems that were scattered around. So it might, some of it might be in the county courthouse and the, in the Department of Assessors. Some of the other, others might be um, held by a bank in terms of loan information, or it might be held by a county recorder's office that was recording the deeds and, and the transactions of real estate. Um, uh, others of it, still other bits of data might be held in a multiple listing service or on some listing uh, portal somewhere. Our goal was to bring all of that different information together so that, one, we could help people more quickly get access to the data that they thought was relevant for them, um, but, but also so that we could then build a variety of analytical products which we thought actually helped uh, consumers understand the marketplace even, even better um, if we were to bring all that uh, information together. So well, I guess we, we like it. The problem, as we saw it back in 2005, is one in which you're, you're in a dark room, and oftentimes we would find ourselves where we might be able to find you know, one particular house for sale, and it was like in this very dark room, we could, we could shine a flashlight and see one particular property, and then we might uh, shine a flashlight on another property that, was, that had just come up for sale, and we'd be able to look at it for a while before turning the flashlight uh, to some other house still. Um, but what we really wanted to be able to do was, um, while we're looking at that one house, you know, there might be some other house. We'd really like to turn the lights on in the room overall so that we could see, oh, well, while I was looking at this one house, there's this whole other, ho this whole other house 
you know, a few blocks away, which I might like to see as well. And in fact, you'd like to be able to um, really be able to uh, see not just the, the other house a few blocks away, but you'd like to be able to see new constructions that were out there, homes that had sold recently, foreclosures, homes that were for, for rent, which would maybe start you thinking about the process of, well, maybe I don't want to sell my house, I want to rent it instead. Um, and uh, of course, you'd want to be able to see all the homes that had recently sold. Um, so all this information was out there back in 2005 when people were interacting uh, in, in the real estate context, they were oftentimes doing so in more of that isolated fashion uh, that I described before, you know, shining a light in a dark room as opposed to really being able to survey everything out there. Um, so what we endeavored to do is to create basically the, the view of real estate that you're looking at now, where you can see everything that's happened around you as well as you can see homes that aren't even on the market right now, and you can see facts about them and estimated market values and everything else. It's, I guess, our core belief that animated us from the very early days was that transparency in the marketplace was really good for everyone, uh, that it's, you know, it's been shown to be uh, to, to make markets more efficient in, in a number of different cases, um, from financial products to uh, online travel to insurance products to, um, to, to auto buying, where increased transparency makes those marketplaces more efficient and therefore the consumer wins. Um, in terms of, you know, the first part of what we tried to do was really around kind of centralization of data, um, but along with that went a number of analytic products which we thought would really help consumers start to, as opposed to just assaulting the consumer with an enormous amount of big data, um, we thought that uh, it would be helpful to actually boil some of that down into some derivative products um, that required some advanced analytics to do that would help them get to the real questions they wanted answered more quickly. So oftentimes what people wanted real estate data for was to understand estimated market values, for example. And uh, one way to do that would be, which you can, of course, still do on Zillow today, is download a bunch of comp uh, comparable homes, recently sold homes in your area, and do your own analysis. Um, but uh, we wanted to be able to uh, provide that type of analysis of estimated market values for every home, regardless of people's ability to analytically, an analytically manipulate the data themselves. Um, so one of our first core uh, um, analytic products was what we call the Zestimate, which is essentially an estimated fair market value that we placed on, on every home in the country, um, where we're estimating if you were to sell this house today, roughly what would it sell for? Um, and it has a point estimate, which is called the Zestimate. It also has a confidence interval, which is called a value range. And then we were also obsessive from the very beginning about um, telling people what the accuracy was of that estimate um, in, their, in, in, in the area that they're looking at. Um, but as you can see here, this is an example of a, of a home details page on, on Zillow where you can see photos of the house. You can see the attributes of, of the home in terms of bedrooms and bathrooms and square footage. This house actually in Alexandria happens to be for sale. Um, and then you can see the estimated market value there below the for sale price, which is this estimate. Um, and um, uh, so um, looks like they're about $485,000 is what we're estimating the fair market value for that house to be. Um, so the, the second analytic product um, that, uh, that we thought was very helpful to consumers is really the analog of the Zestimate for the rental space, um, which is the rent Zestimate, which is um, <clears throat> an estimate of what you know, we think the house would, would rent for if you were to put it out in the rental market. And here we're looking at a house also in Alexandria where the house is not for sale, but you can still find out all the facts that we're able to, to glean about it. Um, looks like it's a one-bathroom house, 860 square feet. Um, this is actually pretty close in um, to, uh, to the D.C. center core or urban core, so it's got a pretty high market value of $336,000, and we estimate that you could rent that house out for just over $1,800 a month. Um, and it, it, we, the rent estimate is actually, I think, an example of something that consumers would not have probably articulated that they wanted to see this initially, but once we presented it to them, um, it's, it's really opened up a whole lot of conversations that would not have happened before, uh, where you know, in, in the market in which we have now, um, particularly the ones in the past few years where we've, st we've still seen uh, home values falling, were markets where people might want to sell their home, but um, 
good market conditions, it wasn't very desirable. And suddenly, by seeing a rent estimate, it occurred to them, well, maybe I should rent the house out because that actually the rent that you're showing there is actually clear as my mortgage, and maybe that's a good option is I'll rent the house out and, and, and lay up for a couple of years until market conditions are better. So it's actually proven very popular with, uh, with consumers. And then the, uh, the third analytic product um, is uh, one that is actually a, a home value index called the Zillow Home Value Index, which is uh, essentially an indicator of what's happening to, to home values in, in, in various geographies um, around the country. And we pursued a methodology for this uh, that was uh, radically more computationally complex than what existed before. Uh, previously, people had used what's called repeat sales methodology for creating home price indices. Um, that's a methodology that really does not allow you to get very granular geographically. Um, and we found that consumers really wanted to know what's happening in their zip code in their neighborhood. So what you're seeing here is a chart that you would find on any page on Zillow where the solid line is telling you what's happened to the home value of that house. And then the dotted lines are telling you what's happening to home values around the house. Uh, one is the trend line for home values in Alexandria, Virginia. And then the other is the trend line for the neighborhood in which this home is located, which is called Seminary Hill in Alexandria. Um, so it's with this newer methodology that, we've, that, we, uh, that, that we actually created uh, uh, that we're able to get down to that granularity and tell you what's happening to home values there. Um, in terms of, so that's a little bit about kind of what we're trying to do in the marketplace. Um, uh, in terms of how we're doing it and the scale at which we're doing it, um, that's what I wanted to turn to next. And um, generally, when, when we launched back in 2006, um, we were creating valuations on about 43 million homes, um, and we did that about, about once a month at that time. Um, in order to do that, we created what we thought at the time was 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 pretty amazing, which was we, we were creating, uh, for each run, 34,000 statistical models in order to do that, and we consumed about two terabytes of data in that process. Uh, flat, you know, you know, flash forward to, to today, and now we're creating evaluations on 100 million homes, and we do that three times a week. Um, and to do that, we, we build uh, 1.2 million statistical models every single run. So that's 3.6 million statistical models every week. Um, so after each night they run, those models are all thrown away um, once they've been used to score homes, and they are all, they are all rebuilt the following, uh, the following time we run. And in order to, to build those models, we push through about four terabytes of data across those models. Um, so it's an enormously uh, complex um, uh, uh, algorithmic process and also a challenge in terms of handling big data um, uh, efficiently. Um, in terms of the, the technical infrastructure that, um, well, before, before I move to technical infrastructure, I should, I should make one, one more note about the, the, the fact of what we've been able to do of being able to, to coalesce different data sources that used to live in different places and put it all together, uh, not only is really helpful to the consumer because now they can find it all in one place and really they can see more of a, our, our goal is to have a, a database of every single address in the United States and then hang off of each of those addresses every single thing that has ever happened to, uh, to, that, to that home, which is a fundamentally different concept than most real estate websites that existed before where they were just looking at what was currently listed for sale in the market. And homes are listed for sale, uh, you know, uh, usually about every seven to ten years. Um, so once they came off of a listing website, they would disappear from view for the next seven to ten years. We wanted to get more per of a persistent uh, view across the housing stock. Um, so that was the consumer motivation, but in terms of the analytic opportunities that it's opened up for us, having a database like this and the infrastructure to crunch enormous amounts of data has allowed us to really provide insights into a lot of different areas now. And, and one of these is, uh, for example, negative equity is the one I'm showing here, where we were able to combine our estimates of values on homes across the country. Uh, with, uh, with mortgage information and outstanding mortgage balances to help people understand uh, the, the prevalence of what we call negative equity in the real estate space, which is when a homeowner's outstanding mortgage balance is, is greater than the current value of their home. And this is a heat map of negative equity in the New York, uh, New York metro area um, where we're showing by zip code uh, the percentage of homes that are underwater, meaning a negative equity, and then within each zip code we show the distribution of negative equity in that, in that area. Um, so um, 
having a database uh, of, of the size and having all these different data elements and the infrastructure to uh, quickly process um, and, and do uh, uh, quick, um, uh, quick statistically complex tasks has really allowed us to, to, um, to, to leverage the data to an extent that was not possible before. Um, I would say that uh, in terms of kind of the evolution of our technical infrastructure, um, I'm going to describe a little bit about kind of the, the different technologies we've used and what they've done to the life cycle evolution. But I should also say that uh, um, in terms of, you know, back in 2005 and 2006 when we were first starting this, basically our, our infrastructure was uh, fairly traditional where we were prototyping in a statistical language called R, open source program um, software, and we were then re-implementing re that uh, those algorithms in a faster uh, language like Java or, or, or C or C++. Um, we were also utilizing internal grids of computers where we would create uh, banks of uh, 50 or so computers and run uh, MPI or Condor or some uh, 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 parallelization framework on, the, on that internal grid, and uh, we were doing our processing in that fashion. Um, since that time, of course, as, as Alistair alluded to, we've seen the rise of, of true cloud computing um, where we are now able to, to leverage um, cloud infrastructures like Amazon Web Services or, or Microsoft Azure to really spin up anywhere from 100 to 500 nodes in the cloud in order to do this processing, um, and um, which is, again, a, a key aspect of why we're able to quickly um, uh, dive into things like negative equity. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the, the life cycle and the evolution of the technology uh, that we're using, where we originally were, were prototyping in R, um, then creating specifications that describe that algorithm, and then having engineers recode it in Java or C, which we then took that that um, that software and, and validated against the original prototype, and then we deployed it. This was a very long life cycle where it would take six to nine months to kind of get from start to end of this life cycle, and then plus it also made the the tweaks that have to happen after it's deployed much longer to uh, to those, those tweaks were hard to do because you were running in Java code. If you had a problem you wanted to look at, you had to prototype it in R and then figure out how it worked in Java again. Um, uh, since that time, we've moved now to, again, because we're able to leverage cheap computing power in the cloud, um, we've moved to a world in which we're prototyping in R and we're actually then uh, moving that code directly into production, um, um, into the cloud, typically where we don't then need to re-implement in a faster language, but so R is a little bit slower than Java or C, uh, a lot slower than C, um, but um, it just doesn't matter because compute power is so cheap. So we, the fact that we are now, um, you know, consistently in the same technology infrastructure of R really has uh, dramatically improved our ability to uh, ship product and we don't have to re-implement things in, in Java. So. Um, you know, now our cycle time is, you know, from a, from a new idea and, and being able to deploy it is, is as low as uh, is under a month now, um, which is which is which is um, you know quite a big improvement from where it was before. So that's a little bit of just a, a brief preview of what uh, what we're hoping to um, cover in more detail later this month, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, see if there are any questions out there. Awesome. Thank you, Stan. Um, and I'm going to be selfish here before we go to questions from the crowd. Um, you're an economist by trade, right? That's correct. So uh, you talked about how this is really making the market efficient and it's great for consumers and everyone loves it. Uh, I'm guessing that not everyone loves it. How do agents and people who used to benefit from arbitrage and market inefficiency react to this kind of information? Um, yeah, you know, I think in general, um, you know, initially there was probably some, um, you know, getting used to the, the new world of, wow, this, this data is now ubiquitous and it's going to be out there and, and how do we work with consumers where they may actually come, come armed to uh, conversations with real estate professionals with a lot of data already. Um, but I think that um, as, as folks have gotten used to that new world, um, that the real estate professionals have, have, have also uh, seen that it's allowed them to move to a place where actually their value add, um, it, they're, they're putting different emphasis on what their value add is, where real estate is a, 
uh, is a fairly infrequent uh, transaction time, fairly high price transaction. So when you're typically selling and buying and selling things that are hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're doing so only every seven to ten years, those are almost always agent-mediated marketplaces. You know, it's not like you're uh, booking travel for, uh, you know, $300, $300 a time and you're going to do it three times a year. Um, which is less of an agent mediated. Uh, those characteristics of that transaction are less agent agent mediated. Uh, real estate is a very has all the characteristics of one in which you would like a real estate professional who's done this before to help you guide you through that process. And I think that real estate agents understand now that we're, what we're trying to do is is uh, is provide complete transparency in the marketplace, and it's pushed them to. Um, uh, focus on the areas of real value creation that have always been present in, in what they did, which was really advising their clients about uh, what was right for them, neighborhoods they may not have been thinking of looking at before, helping in negotiating and refining the price itself, a whole host of, of uh, other things, understanding what future development may be occurring in the area that's going to impact your house, uh, transactional details and legal details. So it's really pushed them to, that's a place where they've always added real value, and it's a place where I think consumers still see value, but it just means that they're doing less of the, you know, sending listings around an email to, to clients and driving them around the car to, to see them necessarily. Instead, they're focusing on things where, um, you know, there's, uh, there, there's other real value that they're attaching to the process. Okay. A um, couple of questions from the audience. Uh, Parna Pandey wants to know, are you using our Hadoop for parallelization? Uh, no, we're not. We, we did look at um, using um, Hadoop infrastructure for parallelization, and we, we, we I guess, uh, we, we still think about it and kind of look at it and play with it a little bit. But generally for our solutions, we ended up um, implementing our own parallelization framework. Um, I think we would have ended up in a different place on that had our problem, i.e. real estate, not been so eminently parallelizable um, because um, – because real estate is, if you think about what we're trying to do when we value homes, it is a very geographically specific context. Um, and because it is, it means that it's easy to parallelize where you can say, you know, take this grid coordinate, take this box or this county or this zip code or whatever you want to define it or the census tract, and, uh, you know, everything you need to know to value a house in that census tract is already in there. And you can send that off to a, to a node to process. Um, I think if it had not been so, we might have thought more, we might have moved more towards Hadoop. But given that basically our task is to, uh, you know, fragment the market, segment it, and then spin up nodes to to, uh, to do things, that was one that was pretty stri more straightforward to do. Um, you know, it was embarrassingly parallel, and uh, we chose to implement our own architecture for that parallelization and the um, management of the of the slave nodes. Okay, cool. And uh, one more quick question for you. Um, talk about the trigger. At what point does it make it okay to move to a public cloud infrastructure. You must have some amount of on-premise stuff you can run, and then there's a sort of tipping point at which you have some kind of threshold that makes it cost-effective or wise to move to an on-demand infrastructure. Yeah, I guess I, I would say that, you know, generally, you know, for, for there seems to be a, a, I guess I think it makes the most sense probably very early in, in a development life or in a, in, a, in a startup's life cycle and also much later as you get very large. I mean, early on it's pretty nice because you don't have to have big IT staffs to, to, to do things and it's pretty, it's very easy to get started up on the cloud. You know, I mean, at this point, like our statisticians and mathematicians can spin up nodes and it's, it's that straightforward. We don't really even need engineers to do that. So I think very early it was nice to have access to, well, very early for us we, we didn't have access to that, but today I think it be very easy to do that, and also very late once your data becomes very big. But but I would say that you know even now we do choose to compute power. You mentioned Moore's law before; it's just become so cheap, and we have pretty large machines internally that um, you know oftentimes just for our nightly runs, which are very data intensive. Sometimes we we will do those internally, but definitely once we start to any historical job where we do where we're recomputing. 20 years of estimates on 100 million homes, that's definitely something that goes to the cloud, which is so enormously complex that we need to spin up 500 nodes to do that. Great. Um, so I got more questions, and so does the audience, but we're going to have to move along in respect to time. But if you want to jump into the chat room, I know there's at least one other question about the structured nature of your data that you may want to address. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this with us, and uh, it sounds like the presentation in New York is going to be awesome. Good. Pleasure to be here. All right, up next, um, we are going to uh, switch from housing to baseball, all the important things. Um, 
the movie Moneyball certainly vulgarized the idea of data science uh, for the masses uh, a little while ago, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, some some of the analysis that happens in uh, Major League Baseball, uh, the amount of data that's captured there, and in this particular case, visualizing pitching patterns. Uh, our speakers today are going to be Richard Brath, and replacing Noah Schwartz is Craig Glazer, um, and they're going to spend a little time talking about Major League's big data and visualizing pitching platforms. Hi guys, this is Craig Glazer from Bloomberg Sports. I'm filling in for Noah here. Uh, basically, today we're going to start talking about making major league data work. Uh, first, I'll give a brief introduction to the history of stats in baseball, and then we're going to go into uh, the new data sets, the large data sets, and how they are being uh, used and implemented in the game. So basically, Bloomberg Sports started because Bloomberg, the core business of the terminal, has been used for the past 30 years to evaluate stocks and portfolios. Uh, they bring together a lot of huge data sets, uh, different data sets, and present them in a way that can be used efficiently together. Um, four years ago, the company decided that they wanted to start exploring other data-heavy businesses since they had so much skill in bringing large data sets together and data was expanding rapidly for so many industries, including sports. So the idea was to view players on a team as different stocks and the teams as portfolios, kind of, to uh, correlate to the stock market uh, area which Bloomberg was already working in. Um, the sport of baseball had already been sparked in terms of data analysis by the Moneyball Revolution, and so we decided to start with baseball. Um, after a few months, uh, we were able to get acquire all the different data sets, bring together raw statistics, player biography information, start doing some analytics, and pull in some news so that it was all in the same place. Uh, this was a good start, but it didn't tell the whole story, and it's not always the uh, most reliable way for players or front office members to view the data, so we realized that we needed to really work on visualizing the data. Uh, working with Oculus, um, we found different ways to visualize the data to, to tell the story behind the numbers, and that's what we're going to talk about. So this is an example of a scorecard from the late 1800s. This is how baseball statistics started out. Uh, the system of collecting them didn't change all that much up until a few years ago, and then it changed a lot, um, which made the data set expand dramatically, which opened up a clear path for us to start presenting the data. Uh, back in these days, most of the stats that were looked at were counting stats. You had your hits, your at-bats, your strikeouts, your walks. Um, they told you what happened, but you didn't get much context, and they didn't really tell you the value of the players. It was always up to the user to interpret the data. Um, as things got a little more complicated, you know, people started looking at some rate sets like batting average. But even batting average is pretty simple, and it's just the number of times that you get a hit divided by the number of the bats that you had. It, do, it doesn't tell, a higher number is obviously good, but it doesn't tell you that much about the player or their value. Uh, over the years, statistics have evolved a lot. From batting average, people realized that there were other valuable things that batters did besides just get hits. In fact, the whole Moneyball revolution, one of the big takeaway points is that on-base percentage is much more important than batting average because it includes things like walks. So a walk is almost as good as a single, but for a long time in baseball, that was not the thought process. The thought process was that getting hits was important, not much else was important, and so walks were and continue to be, in fact, uh, undervalued. Um, slugging percentage is another stat which became more important as time went on when people realized that guys who hit a lot of home runs and guys who hit a lot of doubles are more valuable than guys who hit singles, even if their batting average might be the same or even a little lower. Um, then the next step sort of 
flattened out at the point where people were using average on base percentage and slugging, what's known as the triple slash line, and even adding on base percentage and slugging together to form a set called OPS. OPS is a very good measure. Uh, if you don't have much time to do much in-depth analysis, it tells you a lot about how productive a batter is. But another step was to provide the proper weights for each outcome of, an, of a plate appearance, which uh, formed the formula you can see at the bottom here, WOBA, W-O-B-A, which is weighted on base average, which is basically each outcome weighted properly per plate appearance to give you one number which you can use to judge how productive a batter is. Um, as computers got involved in collecting and distributing the data, the data became more granular and more available in real time. Um, and a lot of news was generated at all, uh, as well. So one of our first steps was to try to combine the play-by-play -play data and the news that was generated about the sport. Uh, the next step, beyond just collecting statistics on what happened, started with PitchFX, a system developed by Sport Vision, which debuted in the 2006 uh, playoffs. The, in the 2006 playoffs, it was used for TV examples. As you can see here, screen overlays were created, which would show viewers at home exactly where the pitch had ended up whether it was in the strike zone, uh, sometimes the break on the pitch, which is also collected by PitchFX. And it has been also used online. MLB uses it as part of their game day application. So now when you go online and you're watching the game, instead of just seeing what happened as the outcomes, you can see the actual pitches which are being thrown by the pitcher, the path which they take through the air, and where they end up uh, for the batter. Uh, this system basically allowed us to go down a level. Instead of going play by play and just looking at the outcomes, we can now look at pitch by pitch data and see the process which ended up in those outcomes. Uh, teams were excited about this data, but they were caught off guard a little bit and didn't really have people in the organizations who were specialized at, at analyzing this kind of data. And in fact, this data became very popular for uh, amateur baseball people online because MLB either decided or just happened to leave their directories open so people could download all of this data, and a lot of homebrew work started happening on it. And with 750,000 pitches per season, there was a lot to analyze. Um, and one of the core ideas that we had for our product when we got this data was to use the data to predict which pitch was going to be next. Now, when a batter has an idea about what kind of pitch is coming next, they're going to perform better. This is why it's so dangerous for pitchers to fall behind in the count because batters know that a fastball is likely to come because the pitcher can't really afford to walk the batter. And it's also why when a batter gets behind in the count when there's two strikes, the pitcher has a lot of ability to change up their pitch selection and it's going to be very hard for the, pitch, for the batter to be successful. Uh, just an example of three quotes that show why, how players feel about predictability. Uh, C.J. Wilson said that pitchers fall into traps, they get predictable with pitch sequences. So there's always a trade-off with pitch sequences. Uh, you want to set the batter up. You want to go low and outside and then come high and inside so that you're changing their eye level and where they, they can't see the pitches effectively because they're looking elsewhere. But if you do that every time, then they will know and you'll be predictable and therefore it'll be more hittable. Uh, James Shields, who pitched a great game yesterday, said earlier this season when he was struggling that it was time to stop being so predictable in his pitch selection. And if you look at his stats after when he said this, he has performed much better. So maybe he really is being less predictable. And uh, the Star Tribune talking about NL Cy Young candidate Johnny Cueto 
said that he throws a lot of things at you and he's not really predictable at all, and that might be part of why he's had so much success this year. Um, our first instinct was to try to view these pitch sequences as decision trees. You could just kind of see, split off the tree into the different percentages that the pitcher had thrown for the first pitch. If he's throwing a fastball or a curveball, you could have the percentages there. And then from the fastballs, you could split it off the same way and keep going down a tree like that. That was one of the first ways we decided to visualize it, but uh, Oculus had some other ideas for us. Sure. Uh, so this is Richard, and uh, I just want to go now specifically into one of the visualizations looking at uh, pitch sequence. So we're just giving a, a very small slice of the data in our little uh, introductory presentation today. And uh, the notion of the pitch sequence and using something like a decision tree isn't necessary. It's a good way to think about it from a computer standpoint, but not necessarily a good way to think about it from a, a user interface. You really need to have something that's uh, simple and easy to understand because uh, for a number of different reasons. One of them is your, your users are, are coaches and players. They don't necessarily have a lot of time uh, available. They need things that are very uh, quick uh, to understand. Reading through text snippets and branches and things like that isn't exactly quick. You also want things that can reveal the patterns, really make the patterns pop out. And if you do that right, then those patterns uh, are more easily remembered. So when you do go out into the field, you might be able to retain some of those insights that, uh, that you've gleaned. So we're going to look at uh, an example of uh, one of these visualizations for, for pitch sequence here. And we're going to look at it uh, for uh, CC Sabathia. Uh, if you don't know CC Sabathia, he's a pretty incredible pitcher for the Yankees, uh, one of the highest played players. And one of the things that makes him so incredible and valuable is that he's really good at a wide variety of pitches. Uh, fastball, sinker, uh, slider, changeup, uh, curveball. He's uh, incredibly talented in terms of what it is that uh, he can put over the plate to, uh, to players. And so uh, we're going to show you this visualization in the context of uh, CC. And the visualization we're going to focus on it specifically for uh, left-handed pitchers, I'm uh, sorry, left-handed batters. And we're looking at a, a snapshot of data from 2011, 2012. Uh, these are just snapshots. We can't show them interactively here, uh, but uh, you get a sense of it. Uh, so here we're looking at the snapshot only for the uh, left-handed hitters uh, because the strategy will vary significantly depending on whether the uh, batter coming up to the plate is a left-handed or right-handed batter. Now, to explain what it is that you're actually looking at here, we'll just step through the visual. The inner ring that you have there really is effectively a pie chart, and that inner ring is the very first pitch that we're seeing. And so in this case here, you can see um, that uh, the largest portion for the first pitch is red. That corresponds to a fastball 50% of the time. His first pitch is a fastball. And then you can see some smaller slices there that correspond to the uh, slider, uh, sinker, and curveball, and so forth. Now, if we back that out to the next level, we're now looking at the second pitch when we add that on. And uh, that second pitch is aligned with the inner ring. So if we look at uh, just this highlighted segment here, that highlighted segment corresponds to where all the first pitches are fastballs. And then we can see for the second pitch the breakdown of fastballs, uh, sliders, and sinkers, and so forth. And again, if this is fully interactive, we just move over it and get some details and see, for instance, that the fastball-fastball combination uh, is the most common for those first two. The initial fastball, like we said before, was 50%. The second fastball is about another 50-ish uh, percent. I can't read it. I think it's 45%. Uh, and then we take that further and add another ring, and we can successively add on more and more rings in here. You get the idea by now. So we're looking at, uh, in this case, three pitches, the first three pitches that you're going to see from uh, CC Sabathia. And uh, the most common sequence that you're going to see is the fastball, fastball, slider combination. That's what he had been pitching throughout uh, 11 and 12. And uh, it's about 50%, 50%, 50% for each pitch. So about an eighth of the time, that's the combination that uh, you're going to see coming from CC Sabathia. But now that we've got this visual representation, these interactions, we can start to glean all kinds of other insights uh, as well. 
And uh, so, for example, here we can look at the uh, slider, slider, slider combination, perhaps the uh, next most likely combination. And here you can see he gets into a groove and he's throwing uh, straight sliders uh, all the way through. Uh, in fact, you can say, gee, what is this thing about sliders and getting into sliders? And you can point at different areas and say, gee, once he starts getting into sliders, he's actually a lot more likely to follow up with another slider. So initially, he's probably only 34% chance, uh, what we can see there, uh, for an initial slider. But when we go down to successive sliders, that percentage increases. We move around and test and check any of these areas, and he moves up and increases those number of sliders. Uh, another insight you can gain is just by looking at the uh, perimeter, for example. And around the perimeter, you can see there's uh, some red there, some uh, fastballs. But it's not really that much of the, uh, of the perimeter. So we're not looking at, uh, on the initial pitch, we had 50% uh, fastballs. But when you get around to the perimeter on the third pitch, we're definitely not at, uh, at 50%. So you can see how by going through this and taking a look at some of these things, we can certainly come up with a number of uh, different patterns uh, that we can see. So uh, in this case here, he's very likely to start off with a fastball. He's likely to follow a slider with another slider. And he's likely to throw fewer fastballs on the third pitch than he is on the, uh, on the first pitch. Uh, we're getting through our time. So I've got another example here that I'm just going to uh, skip over uh, before, uh, I'll, I'll save the other example for the Strata New York conference, uh, also another way of looking at, uh, at the pitch sequences. And uh, really just say that uh, this is really just a small slice, oops, there we go. This is just a, a small slice of the data that's available. So. Um, as Craig was talking before, this pitch FX data, uh, you've got all this incredible detailed data, but the pitch FX data as well is also a video uh, component associated with that, and there's all kinds of video information. In addition to this rich uh, information that's available with just um, pitch FX and video and all the historical stats, there's more and more different kinds of data coming online in the future as well. So uh, HitFX is a new system that is coming online that will measure the uh, ball as it uh, hits the bat. And then another system, uh, FieldFX, which will track the movement of the players in the field. So uh, we really think uh, there's a huge change happening here in baseball, in this revolution that started with historically Sabre metrics and now uh, through the HitFX data, uh, the PitchFX data. And then as we add in HitFX and FieldFX, the game is going to change, and uh, there's going to be areas that traditionally have been very difficult to uh, measure uh, statistically, and uh, defense is one area that has been difficult to measure statistically. And this new data streams that are coming online are going to make uh, baseball very interesting in terms of what you can do analytically. So we've got a lot of data, and it is growing fast in terms of the baseball uh, world. So in conclusion, on the pitch sequences, you can see that uh, the sequence, uh, what we can reveal there, the count I'll be revealing more at uh, the Strata conference. And in the background, we've got a very large, rich, interesting data set to work with, and that statistics and probabilistic concepts and uh, data visualization can all make this much more valuable to the uh, players and coaches and teams that uh, want to leverage this. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, and I appreciate you cutting it out there because this is fascinating, but we are running up against the clock. Uh, one quick question for you. Um, it seems to me like this is the kind of stuff where once the players become aware of it, it changes the data. So um, obviously there's a feedback loop here. You know, if someone's – the, the pitcher that looks at this data would say, oh, I didn't know I had that pattern. I better mix it up. Um, have you noticed any changes in data in response to the feedback loop you create by playing this back to people, or are they just so in the game that they – they lose their ability to sort of get out of their loop and they give themselves away anyway. Uh, I'll let Craig answer that. Uh, I think that while we're presenting this data in new ways, I think, and it's becoming very automated and very available, I think players have had access to things like this a lot in the past. So I think that we're all, we've already seen a lot of that change happen uh, because we're not really Introducing the feedback loop, we're more just making it more automated, more fast, less work for everybody, 
we are finding new things, but um, I think the game theory aspect was already pretty uh, established to begin with. And, and from the from the sorry, example that we have here, sorry, from the example we have here, we're taking a very long time span chunk, but you can certainly look at and see trends that change, uh, as we were saying before, month by month. Uh, as players uh, take a look at uh, these kinds of things, presumably they're having an impact on what they then do and change about themselves. It's really like building a website and testing a website. Yeah, the, the James Shield quote, Shields quote from earlier is a great example of a guy who was slumping, realized that it was because he was too predictable, changed it, and has had a great uh, performance since then. Thanks. Uh, one quick question. Jean-Pierre de Manignon uh, asked about basketball analysis. I guess I'll expand that to say, this is something that's happening in all fields, right? Football, basketball, baseball. How's it? Um, each of the do each of the leagues or run that stuff themselves, or is it something that organizations like yourselves uh, pull out separately? Uh, I think most, very few of the leagues have gotten into the actual process of setting up the data collection themselves, but they definitely work with the people who come in with ideas on how to collect it and then they have a say in how it gets distributed and uh, exactly how it's implemented. So Sport Vision was the company that did Pitch FX. They're also the ones behind Field FX and Hit FX, but they work extremely closely with uh, Major League Baseball Advanced Media, which is one of our partners, which is who we get that data from. So it's uh, a lot of it seems to be other companies coming in and working with the organizations, although I think in basketball one of the main companies that is capturing data and statistics is actually owned by Mark Cuban. So that's an example of a owner of a team seeing a need and filling it himself. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys. It's a fascinating topic, and I'm sure it's going to be a big hit in the Big Apple if you spend time explaining why the Yankees are doing well or badly. You're going to have a lot of people's um, strong opinions on the floor, so I'm looking forward to hearing it. See you in a few weeks. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, up next, unfortunately, Terrence Craig couldn't be with us, and uh, our wishes go out to him today. Um, but his uh, partner in crime, Mary, uh, is with us to talk about privacy and big data. Uh, Mary and Terrence are, are uh, seldom ones to shy away from controversy, and they've made some broad, sweeping statements, many, many of which have come true in in past strata events, um, and they're really going to be talking about the the changes of what it, what privacy means in an era where we're all ubiquitously connected, and um, everything we do and say is sort of tweeted and shared and liked and plus one online. Um, so I'm going to hand things over to Mary to talk a little bit and give you a taste of what she's going to be discussing around privacy and big data in a digital age. Thanks, Alistair. Well, as Alistair mentioned in his opening remarks, big data tech is certainly a disruptive force. And it's enabled lots and lots of good things. And it's also, I think, sometimes led us down a path where we find ourselves asking, just because we can do something, does it necessarily mean that we should? And such, I think, is the case with privacy and big data. Um, late last year, Terrence, who is my partner in crime, and I published a book on privacy and big data, which essentially described the privacy landscape from a cultural, regulatory, and what we like to call player perspective. And we wrote the book because in our business, which is big data analytics, we deal with the privacy issues um, pretty much every day. And we've seen firsthand how big data tech has made it possible to know more about us than ever before and maybe more interestingly enough, as well as increasingly make accurate predictions of our future actions. So for anyone operating in the big data space, Privacy is a complicated topic, and we've all seen many examples of privacy missteps, some of them the result of unintended consequences and others the result of just not thoroughly understanding the data privacy and security issues. So today, Alistair has asked me to answer this very simple question. Is there such a thing as privacy in the digital age? And although it sounds simple enough, any of us who have engaged in privacy discussions often find that we sort of wander up against this thing where one person's privacy violation may be another person's cool new app. So what I'm going to try to do in the next 20 minutes is give you the Cliff Notes version on the state of privacy today, as well as some thoughts on privacy in general. And at Strata New York City, Terrence and I will attempt to illustrate in real time our answer to this question, as well as talk about how one should think about privacy when it comes to ourselves and our businesses. So, in case you don't know, 
Whether you realize it or not, offline or online, we're all being tracked and the data is being collected and tied back to us. And some of it we know. I mean, we understand that when we, talk, when we use Facebook and Google that we're exchanging our personal information in return for their services and that they are then using that information to serve up better ads to us. But we're not only being tracked basically through the devices that we own. We are also being tracked through devices that we encounter in our everyday lives. So those CCTV cameras on the streets and in stores and banks at ATMs, they capture us, as do easy pass tags when we go over bridges, et cetera. So we live in a digital world and are pretty much connected 24-7. And all of the stuff in this world is collecting data about us and then using that data to build a pretty detailed profile. So when we talk about privacy, we often sort of descend into this conversation about how something creeps us out. But digital privacy is not really about whether you or I, where you or I fall sort of on the creepiness scale. It actually is about data collectors and marketplaces that sell our personal information for known and sometimes unknown purposes. And before the big data age, much of the digital data collected about us was sort of siloed. But today that same data is being collected now and tied back to us. And it's not just about our names or gender or addresses anymore. It's about what we like, what we don't like, what party we belong to, who our friends are, how much we pay for our house, whether we are ever filed for bankruptcy, what charities we've given money to. And if you don't believe that it's quite gotten to this state, I encourage you to do two things. One is just Google, Google yourself. And then the second thing is go to a personal data aggregator site like Spokio and Spokio yourself. And what you'll find is that there's a lot of data out there about you, and much of it is accurate, and then some of it is not. So how did we get here? Well, this slide illustrates how the value, volume, and quality of our personal information has sort of grown over time. You know, in the days of Sears and Roebuck, which was a long ago far away direct mail days, the best you could do is ship sales catalogs to an address with no real idea of what the demographics of that address were, like the income level or the age or number of people in the house. And then we move up sort of to the Nielsen era, which is basically the era of market research, which was used to determine consumer buying trends. So small samples were used to make predictions about large groups of people's tastes. So up until this point, we were pretty anonymous. Then we enter sort of the Google area, era, and now we actually have sort of real context to work with. You know, if I've searched for a dishwasher um, with extra processing power, it follows that I might be wanting to buy one of those kinds of dishwashers. And then if you use my browser history, you can start to make some broad but fairly accurate assumptions about where I live, you know, my income level, my age, my sexual orientation, etc. And then Facebook came along and raised the level of information because it introduced information about our relationships. You know, who we're friends with, who we communicate the most with, our shared interests, photographs, those kinds of things. And so now we not only have information about how to persuade you to buy a product or service, but we now know how to persuade your whole social graft. And now here we are in the big data age. We've got the macro, which is the social graph, all the way down to the micro, which is our quant quantified self, along with the Internet of Things, which is all those IP-enabled devices like heart monitors, calorie counters, Fitbits, that are now giving us real-time reports on our health, our location, our level of excitement, et cetera. And the richer that picture becomes, the more valuable it is. But for the most part, the focus of the privacy debate in the U.S. has been on advertising. And certainly it's the engine that has driven the data collection era. But what we need to understand today is that it's not just about what Google and Facebook and Twitter knows about us, it's about what everyone knows about us. Because not only are Google, Facebook, and Twitter collecting data, but almost everyone we deal with is collecting data, and some of the people that we deal with are actually selling that data for other uses. For example, did you know that the Florida DMV sold the personal information of license holders, and that would be your name, address, and birth dates to data collectors, and in doing so collected $63 million. So whether you're a big behemoth or a small mom and pop shop, the data you have on all of us has become very, very valuable. And certainly the selling of that information is a profitable market for all of these companies. And the data that we're collecting 
is not just being used for advertising anymore. It's used for all kinds of purposes, some we may be aware of, some we may be surprised by, and some we may have no knowledge of. You know, I'm sure that we've all read about Target knowing we're pregnant before anyone else does. What Target did was essentially this. It took their loyalty card data, their point of sales data, and a lot of other data they had, matched it all up together, and based on that data was able to predict fairly accurately if someone was pregnant very, very early in the term. And although no laws were broken, Target did not want their customers to view this as creepy, so it made sure that its personalized marketing included other ads and deals not related to pregnancy, because research had shown that pregnant women would take advantage of the deals as long as they did not think that they were being personally tracked. We, also have, we all have credit cards, and we all know about FICO scores, but maybe we don't know that some credit cards are engaged in what we call behavioral scoring, where where you shop and whether the people that you shop with, if they're poor credit risks, your limit could be lowered or card revoked. And finally, the federal police are increasingly gaining real-time access to social media accounts without obtaining search warrants. Just last year, the Department of Justice made live interception requests to social networking and email providers that jumped 80% from the year before. So everyone around us is engaged in either collecting or using our data for other purposes. Which sort of leads me to this question. What does privacy really mean in the digital age? In the oral arguments of U.S. versus Jones, Supreme Court Justice Alioto said this, and it actually goes to the heart, I think, of the privacy debate. It seems to me that the heart of the problem that's presented by this case and will be presented by other cases involving new technology is that in the pre-computer, pre-Internet age, much of the privacy, I would say most of the privacy that people enjoyed was not the result of legal protections or constitutional protections. It was the result simply of the difficulty of traveling around and gathering up information. As Justice Sotomayor observed in her concurring opinion in U.S. versus Jones, the concept of privacy actually needs to be redefined because in keeping with the digital age, the definition of the, what is public has changed dramatically. We have no expectation of privacy in any public spaces. And technology has made it possible now to make sure that we have no expectation of privacy there. So if we have no, when we trade our personal data for a service or a product, that data is considered, for all intents and purposes, public. It's safe to say that in the big data age, the concept of privacy is narrowing. And in the meantime, our government agencies are forging ahead in the use of lots and lots of our data sets. They are one of the largest data buyers in data marketplaces today. And they either buy data sets or via the Patriot Act or other legislation simply uh, require that data be handed over from our cellular providers or Facebook, Google, our banks, et cetera. There is very little transparency. So we don't know all the different uses, but the VA collects data for operational purposes and Medicare and IRS for fraud detection and of course our law enforcement and various intelligence agencies for what they call crime prevention, crime fusion centers and counterterrorism. And our current regulations are either not keeping, in, keeping up with the digital age that we now live in or are designed sort of to circumvent what we would consider to be our existing privacy laws and regulations. And just a note to those of you who live in more enlightened privacy countries than the United States. Anti-terrorist laws across the world trump privacy every time in favor of security. So as a consumer, you may be more protected, but it does not follow that our government agencies are operating under the same restrictions. So where does this really leave us? Well, there is privacy, pending privacy legislation in all regions of the world that promise, if passed, potentially far more rigorous controls. At the same time, there's a real threat now of silo data sets due to privacy fears and how easy it may be to de-anonymize data sets. For example, researchers are already publishing findings that are using private data sets that the scientific community at large can't access because to ensure that those findings are correct, which would be a real disservice to all the kinds of great research we can do with the data sets that we have. And it seems to me right now that there are two main issues we need to address when we talk about privacy. One is our definition in the digital age. 
and really what we should thinking what we should be thinking about when we talk about privacy is how it applies to data collection and its use by any and all parties. And then we need to figure out how to legislate privacy to ensure the consumer's trust that the collection and use of their data achieve the level of enforceable transparency. And transparency includes all privacy players, not just the data collectors, but all the other parties that use our data for various business models, as well as our federal and state agencies. But in the meantime, we continue to see all kinds of privacy models coming into play. All, and they either protect our privacy or use our personal information to achieve certain ends. Now, many of these business models offer us valuable services, but some of them we should be concerned about. For example, Datong on this slide is part of the cyber surveillance industry, and it's selling tech, surveillance tech, to law enforcement agencies around the world. Some of its customers include some of the most repressive regimes around the world, and one can only wonder just what that tech is really being used for. At the end of our book, Terrence and I offered some advice on how to remain private in the digital age. And it was real simple. It's, we basically said whatever goes on the net stays on the net forever. If you today need to keep some information private, you're going to need to keep it off of the digital grid. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'm going to actually put up a slide that gives our Twitter accounts in case you want to find out about Privacy Matters. Terrence and I cover it quite a bit, as well as our blog and our corporate site where we also cover issues of policy. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Alistair. Thank you, Mary, and a good summary of that stuff. I mean, it sounds like this is a very um, thorny issue, but also one that the legislation is just nowhere near ready to address. Um, it, one quick question. It seems like the tension, it, the fundamental tension here is between um, the protection of data, which requires that you tie data to how it is used, versus the fluidity of data, which requires that the data be sort of not encrypted or not um, anonymized to a lookup table or something, and therefore we can work with it more quickly. So you kind of have to choose either um, complicated, slow processing of safe data with its usage properties attached, or um, uh, use of data that's sort of free and fast, but anyone can take anything from it. And, and we haven't found where the right spot between those two extremes is right now. You're right, and, and, and that's the real issue, I think, in, with, behind the whole privacy debate, is what is that spot, and how do we get to it, and then how do we enforce it? And by enforcement, I don't simply mean that we need a whole host of regulations, but I mean, do we, do we use guidelines? Do we have best practices? There's a whole way in which we can approach it, but until we start taking a hard, long look at that issue itself, I think we're going to be arguing about privacy for a long time. Sure. Um, so one person on the chat um, asked if we could get our first couple of speakers uh, to talk about um, privacy and have Mary respond to your comments. Unfortunately, that would be a great idea if we thought of it, but um, one of our speakers had to leave, and I think we're a little behind on time. Uh, but that does sound like the kind of thing that tends to happen in the halls at Strata, and it would be good to do it here. So um, we'll take that as a suggestion for the next event, uh, but thank you for the comment. Um, up next, uh, my colleague John Brunner um, is going to join me, and I, I have uh, – John's a, a student of where technology and industry is going. Uh, he's worked at Forbes before and is now with O'Reilly and um, has spent a lot of time thinking about how this stuff will play out in business and in the world. Uh, so, John, I wanted to spend a few minutes just asking you what you thought you would see um, at the Strata event in New York in a few weeks and uh, where you see this stuff going in the, in the next few months. Sure thing. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you here from uh, – from London, where we've just wrapped up our Strata London um, conference, the first one in uh, in the UK, and um, this has sort of shaped my thinking about what I expect from New York. So, first of all, um, you know, I think the idea of big data has sunk in with a lot of managers enough that we're starting to see some uh, some some sonar waves bounce back to the to, to those of us who have been talking about it for a while. Um, one of the things that uh, that has struck me here is the interest in um, translation. So the, so the idea is that, uh, you know, for, for a long time, a lot of businesses have, have wanted to be data-driven businesses. And that's, a, um, that's something that people have seen uh, the virtue in and, and have striven for. And the archetype in that is sort of uh, is someone like Jeff Bezos at, um, at Amazon. But, but 
what you find is that Jeff Bezos is is at his core a data driven person, and he's the he he runs the company and has a technical background and really knows uh, knows this kind of philosophy. But a lot of CEOs are not Jeff Bezos, and so you have um, you know the the IT people, the the marketing people putting in really sophisticated. Um, you know, data and analytics, and then having trouble communicating it to the rest of the organization. Because big data is really complicated. Um, it gives you results that are far more sophisticated than, uh, you know, whatever you were getting before. And so there's, um, and so there's this need to sort of um, translate it into something that, um, that the rest of the management team can understand. And so one of the, one of the um, interesting um, presentations and, and, and a few conversations that I've had here have been about uh, Narrative Science, which is a company that um, has been a part of uh, O'Reilly events for, for a couple of years now. Narrative Science takes um, unstructured, uh, takes, takes structured uh, numerical data and turns it into text. So um, they actually write a blog for Forbes um, where they write earnings previews and, um, and stock market wrap-ups. So they, um, you know, in a single minute, they might post 50 stories that, that read something like, you know, it was a bad day for Apple as their stock slid 6% against a larger market change of 4%. So they're taking the stock market data and turning it into machine-generated narrative. And um, now they're talking about taking uh, a lot of, you know, business intelligence data and turning it into machine-generated narrative that can be disseminated back into the organization. So you can have a, a restaurant, uh, you know, with 14,000 franchises and uh, you can generate a sales report for each franchise owner that says that makes suggestions like you know your sales were your, your sales of ice cream were down this week because um, the weather has has been colder in Omaha than usual and if the weather trend continues you may want to consider introducing your winter menu um, a week earlier if you increase sales of oatmeal then you'll you know oatmeal by six units a day then you'll see increased profits of this um, so that's a matter of uh, you know, of companies installing big data, the sort of stuff that gets all of us on this, on this phone call excited, and then realizing that, uh, that, that a lot of the people who need to hear the message from the analytics that they're doing can't understand the message, and so we need to find new ways to present it. So I notice when I'm looking through the Strata New York um, <clears throat> uh, schedule that as at a lot of our Strata conferences, visualization plays a big role, and, and visualization is all about translating the insights that we gain from big data into, um, you know, mechanisms that, uh, that people outside of, of sort of analytics teams can, can understand. Um, Alistair, is that, uh, do you think that's a good characterization of why, why you like visualization so much? In the schedule. Well, I, I like visualization because I don't have a PhD in math, um, so it has to be <laughs> translated for someone dumb like me. But I do think that the vulgarization of, of data, you know, the, the brief for Strata has always been more than just data. It's always been this intersection of big data, ubiquitous computing, and uh, new interfaces for both collection and, and display. And I think big data on its own is just sort of sitting there, and without those other things, um, that's directly changing stuff. Uh, one of the things I was most interested by today, um, hearing from the NLD folks and also from Zillow, is um, big data is going to lead to a series of iterations, by which I mean in the first wave of big data, we're going to analyze the heck out of things and sort of become aware of the state of the world, aware that we pitch in a certain way, aware that we're underwater for our housing property. And then that's going to lead to a reaction, a pitcher who changes his or her batting strategy, or a homeowner who um, suddenly, you know, it leads to the explosion of Airbnb or VRBO as more property owners realize that an underwater house is better rented. And so right. I think what's fascinating is, is um, the, the sort of the quantum effects of big data, if you will, that, that when we start to analyze stuff, the results of it change our behavior, which in turn changes the next analysis. And I think it'll be fascinating exactly. to see, you know, it's almost like the way that, um, that trading bots um, in dramatically increase market volatility, only instead of just doing it for stock market prices, we're doing it for every aspect of our lives. Does that mean we're going to see more volatility in our lives? That's a, that's a weird, mm -hmm. you know, there's a blog waiting to be written about that, and that's a weird and speculative future. Right, right. If data becomes a larger part of our lives, then can uh, can sort of the larger forces behind the data control our lives more more tightly, or even um, ourselves, well, because we start to look at it and see that happen, right? Right, right. 
Do you think about something as innocuous as, uh, you know, Google's comprehensive public transit schedules? And, I'm, and I've, I've been using them. I use them all the time in New York. I'm using them a lot this week in London. And they sort of, uh, they, um, you know, they change the way that you get around the city. They change the way that you walk and they change your, the patterns of your life. Um, well, yeah, I, mean, I think when Tim Cook was busily, they, yeah, absolutely. When Tim Cook was busily apologizing for uh, iOS 6's maps, uh, he said it will get better as more people use it. And I think that's a great example of um, one of the reasons Apple had to do that is because mapping is not a publishing effort. It's an interaction effort because you're improving your maps when, I mean, for example, and I don't know if Google does this, but I would imagine that um, if you look at someone who's driving along a route and they suddenly stop and recalculate routes, um, that place right. where they recalculate routes is probably somewhere you should send the car next to map things out because right. maybe traffic's changed. And so we forget that by living in this interactive world, we aren't just displaying information out, we're actually making that information different. Each time someone at um, Zillow goes in and you know, assesses what their house could be worth, um, when that house is sold, you could see how accurate your estimate was and correct your models. And I think right. that kind of model correction of the whole world is going to be a very interesting thing. Right, and that's a crucial part of the whole big data philosophy. It, it's, uh, you, know, you saw the same thing in, um, in Foursquare in the explore um, function of Foursquare, which is a great example of consumer big data operating in the, in the way that, um, that we talk about, you know, big data at the cutting edge. They realized that they had this enormous database of where, um, where people check in and that with a little bit of machine learning, um, they could take your preferences and, and see who else is hanging out in the same places and then using those, you know, people who appear to have similar preferences um, to, to recommend places that you haven't visited yet. And, um, and by the way, just, Justin Moore, who invented that feature at Foursquare, is going to be speaking at uh, Strata New York. He's now with Facebook. Oh, nice. I did not know he built that. That's kind of cool. Um, so one yeah. quick last thought. Um, big data and uh, U.S. elections? Oh, that's going to be interesting. Um, uh, I wish it were easier to do more with big data and U.S. elections. The, the, uh, the data in... Um, you know, on, on political contributions is still very dirty, um, perhaps, uh, you know, partly, partly by accident, partly uh, perhaps because, um, you know, important people would rather not have a cleaner solution. But um, disambiguation is tough in, in, um, in, in, in registering uh, political contributions. You know, um, Rupert Murdoch makes his contributions as uh, Rupert Murdoch of New York, Keith Murdoch of Washington, and K. Rupert Murdoch of Beverly Hills, and of course that's all the same Keith Rupert Murdoch um, in, who, who has houses in three different places. So disambiguation is tricky, and uh, you know people make a lot of assumptions in order to in order to provide crucial services like uh, like the Sunlight Foundation, but um, you know th those those assumptions are are tricky. Sure. Um, well, John, I'm, I'm looking forward to hanging out with you in New York, and I think, as always, there's Likewise. so much interesting stuff going on around here that uh, it's going to be an interest, uh, a curious week, and I, I, I'm hoping we have time to be speculative. We're so frothy about, you know, what's the next big Hadoop and how many terabytes we can analyze in how many femtoseconds that we, we often don't step back and take a look at, at where the data hits the humans, and I think that's where most of the uh, disruptive and potentially ethical uh, chewy issues are. So uh, hopefully we get a chance to discuss right. some of that. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Alistair. And, and one other thought on elections and big data is that, uh, you know, this has been around for a while, but 538 continues to be an impressive effort to use uh, a different different side. I mean, if, if you're talking about polling data and trying to predict the elections, um, they, they've taken an interesting approach that's not the betting market approach that's been favored by economists and political scientists and statisticians for a long time. They're they're trying to build models, take into account different state-by-state -state results. All of you out there, if you haven't really, you know, dived into their methods yet, I think you'd you'd enjoy doing it and thinking about the context of that in, um, in that in the context of, of big data. Cool. Um, okay. Up next, uh, we have uh, Romy joining us to talk about empowering designers to create data visualizations. Romy. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, so um, my talk today is really uh, just a preview to the, uh, to the Strata talk um, I'll, I'll, I'll be giving later this month. Uh, but what I kind of want to chat about is how we can empower designers to create data visualizations. 
uh, before I go on, um, I mean, there's the, just want to make a couple of uh, points. One is uh, one is a that you know the the design part of data visualization. Um, and when I say data visualization, I'm I'm talking about um, how we how data visualization can be used as to explain a topic as opposed as opposed to the exploratory way um, as we do in analytics all the time. Um, and um, and how we could use data visualization to explain is is where a designer really, really comes in and helps um, helps create the designs and the points you want to get across. Um, and 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 why uh, and what I want to talk, talk about is how we can empower and democratize more and more designers and bring them in the data visualization chain to help them create data visualizations. Um, I mean, before I go on into a couple of other points, um, what I think one thing we, we have seen again and again, and this was actually highlight, highlighted by McKinsey report last year, is that uh, data visualizations, when used to explain stuff, is in you know really good quality infographics, uh, maybe maybe uh, even motion graphics. Um, where, where you're trying to where you're trying to explain and bring all, bring across a point uh, with charts and graphs um, are are actually three times more likely to be shared and have an impact compared to just text articles. Um, so uh, using using uh, using data visualizations in uh, um, is a great way to actually bring away uh, and go away from textual. Uh, textual uh, articles and, and a lot of text uh, to to make a point. Uh, what, what we are kind of seeing on both the uh, both the advertisers and both from the advertisers and publishers um, is that it's it's even a, it's a lot more effective uh, six times in case of advertisements and. 12 times in case of publishers when they use data visualizations uh, to explain ads or explain their brand um, as opposed to um, as, as opposed to text. Um, so what like let's just go into like to directly into like you know some of the components that create that are required to create great data visualizations, and the process is actually extremely interdisciplinary. Um, it requires research, it requires data analysis, uh, requires journal journalism, requires design, and in some cases also requires a lot of development ef effort um, at the very end. Um, and the and it's. We find that designers who can do all of these things are increasingly rare, and that's and so what we want to get away is actually like how we can come up with better processes and better collaborative processes among different people and among these like five or six different kinds of people to help create quality visualizations as opposed to letting one person do the entire thing from start to finish. And um, and um, so so what we've realized along the way is that there are there are definitely two two big parts of it. Apart from like just just the design, there's a huge narrative component to it, which the journalist brings along. And there is uh, and there is a uh, there is a very very significant data analysis component to it, which maybe distills down like you know from maybe some internal big data in your organization, which you know you've distilled down, did the analysis, run prototypes, and you're like, okay, you know these are the charts, and this is what I want to show. And and there's a handoff to a you know there's, there's a handoff from there to either like a person who can develop a narrative and then a designer. And and so eventually what I want to talk about in Strata is kind of different case studies and what what the actual collaborative process is among these three or four groups of people to come up with really quality, uh, quality data visualizations. Um, I think um, I, I think I'll leave it at there and you know speak the rest of New York. Uh, I'll just get back to you in case I have any questions. All right, thank you, Romy. Um, good overview, and I think, uh, you know, it, it's going to be hard to get into uh, more details than this without actually using concrete examples of, of real environments and stuff, so uh, looking exactly. forward to seeing what's going on there. Um, let me push up your... Uh, the last slide to make sure that they're there. Um, so what do you think is, is uh, the skill that people are most likely to need 
um, when they it, when they're scientists today and they need to learn how to be designers. I mean, you know, on the one hand, we want the designers more scientific, and on the other hand, the scientists more designery. Yeah, I I think it's um, I, I think it's the the biggest skill is if you if you're a data scientist and we don't want to want to learn to work with designers, um, uh, I mean you can go you can go the traditional path and actually like you know learn learn various skills like the two the two main skills one is like developing narratives for visualizations uh, that's a very very crucial skill and the second is the ability to design which is. I mean, which is which involves like you know Illustrator or Photoshop or InDesign, whatever your what whatever your design tools are. Um, what's actually becoming and what I think is going to be the bridge going forward is less of um, is less of the actual tools, but actually understanding how to communicate with other people. So it's it's like you know the data scientists can, you can actually communicate when there's when there's like some common language um, as a medium. So at least being able for the data scientists to say, okay, I. I, I get that maybe this can be moved into another layer. You know, understanding understanding some basic elements of communication, I think, will be is is the next step to being able to collaborate with the with the designer or different disciplines. Sure, and I like I like what you said about narrative. That oftentimes just sitting down and trying to type out what you're saying as a, as prose will lead will force you to sort of think about what the audience is aware of and how you need to lead them down a particular story. Absolutely, absolutely, and the and the and the narrative is actually how you know how your how your visualization plays about. It's actually just thinking through the audience is that when they're coming to the topic, they 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 do they, if it's if it's internal, they may have an idea of what's going on. But if it's external, they don't they probably don't know a lot about the topic beforehand. And so, how do you how, how do I construct it um, more as a storyboard uh, initially? And we 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 seem that very effective through different wireframes and sketches. Uh, and how do I first construct a storyboard before even going into the design and how the data plays in? Yeah, I once worked with, worked at a company where uh, they had a very smart um, data analysis guy who wasn't very good at communicating. He just sent spreadsheets. And we eventually set up right. a screen recording tool on his desktop, and when he'd sit the spreadsheet, we'd ask him to open it up and press record and explain it to people. And invariably, he'd right. sit there, and for about five minutes, he'd select a row and tell you what it was and so on. And the designers would take that video, and that would sort of tell them this is how, you know, he, he had narrative. He just didn't know how to embed that narrative in the spreadsheet he forwarded until we recorded the screencast of him, you know, mousing over it and moving his mouse around and explaining the data set. Yes, exactly, exactly, and and, and that's this is actually a really, really common scenario where the analyst just like handles, uh, gives gives the gives gives a spreadsheet of a lot of data points, and uh, then it either takes like a designer who understands uh, who has some basic analytic skills to go to that last layer and figure out what the uh, what, what the narrative the other person is trying to speak, or and then and then work collaborate collaboratively to come up with it, or, um, or maybe, in, maybe as an analyst, you know, what we've seen works effectively is, you know, you can actually, like, convey and, you know, maybe try, instead of just sending a spreadsheet, try and maybe create some basic charts or basic visualizations to, you know, come up with your point and try and convey it more effectively. Um, and then the designer can kick it on from there. Sure. Good. Um, well, thank you very much, Romy. Looking forward to your session um, in Strata in a few weeks in New York. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to move on to uh, our next speaker, um, and unfortunately, Sean can't be with us today, so uh, Mike Flasco uh, is going to join us and talk about uh, some of Microsoft's big data solutions. And in particular, um, as, as I've learned more about what Microsoft's doing here, what's interesting is, is there was a story a little while ago about Microsoft uh, innovating at scale, but, uh, not necessarily at speed, but at scale, where Microsoft, when it makes a change, changes everything, and in many ways, the lingua franca of data is uh, Excel and the spreadsheet. So um, an impact on the back end of data um, with a front end like Excel means that that uh, information can be at the hands of millions of people um, without a lot of training. And I think that's something that, that's really come across um, as I've, as I've learned about this stuff, Mike, is, is the, the breadth of de the sort of democratization of data access tools um, that uh, have come up um, through the Microsoft tool chain uh, that are now sort of maybe even plugged into things like Azure on the back end, which are obviously much more, uh, you know, the, the data services and stuff like that. Um, and all of a sudden you've got this, this thing that still looks like the car I just drive to work, but it's actually got a big engine underneath it that's kind of hidden away and I'm not aware of until I step on the gas. 
uh, I'm seeing things up a little bit for you, but but uh, hopefully you're going to touch on uh, some of those things and how um, and where Microsoft's big data strategy is headed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, that's kind of precisely where I wanted to talk down today um, as kind of a precursor to some of the sessions we have uh, coming up at the conference later in the month. Um, but it, short story, that, that's ultimately what we're trying to do is take take some of the kind of hard infrastructure problems out of the way so that you get to spend time in tools that you're familiar with um, that all of a sudden now are lit up with um, all of this insight from a much larger wealth of data than we've traditionally been able to work with uh, inside of our tools, but you know, not feel like we're in an alien place or a different set of uh, processes or workflows that we have to learn. Um, so that's really our goal, and uh, through the next few minutes, we'll talk through some of the things that uh, that we're doing to get there. So with that, let me uh, let me go in one more, and I think kind of the, the question that we were teeing up is, is big data really for everyone? And as we've uh, gotten into this space more as a company, um, we found that you know across the spectrum, as, as we've seen earlier in the webcast today, big data is being leveraged in so many interesting ways. Um, and yet there's still challenges in getting your core infrastructure set up to, you know, deploy, manage, enrich, and do all of these things you need to do before you can sit and actually get insight out of this data. And so one of the things we're doing is really trying to make big data for everyone and, and provide the infrastructure components and the, the overall data platform um, so that going from this wealth of data to insight uh, really is a, uh, a simple operation, a self-service operation, something that everybody can, uh, can start to benefit from. Uh, so with that, um, kind of the way that, that we think about going, uh, going about this from a pretty high level um, to kind of give a, an insight into some of the things we'll, we'll speak more concretely about at the conference, um, is this kind of how we, how we think about our approach all up is one, we want to go and take some of our pedigree in, uh, in, our, in enterprise software and really make it easy for people to have a big data platform in front of them, get it set up in whatever that environment may be, whether it's in the cloud or on-premise or virtualized, uh, and get that set up fairly simply so that they can quickly move from having the uh, tools and components and, uh, and management software in front of them to the point where they're looking at how do I work with this data set? How do I enrich it and join it with other, you know, public or private data sets that I might have access to? And once I've enriched that data to the point where I really can gleam some interesting insight out of it, as we've seen through some of the baseball examples and some of the housing examples, um, how can I really get kind of that, that next level of insight out of my data? Um, and we really are looking at this kind of three-step phase is how can we make this as simple as possible to go from big data to insight? Um, and I think it's interesting because now you're really, as we engage with more and more companies in this area, we're really seeing their, you know, their bottom line is starting to become directly affected by their ability to, to get a modern information platform running um, within their company. And so you're seeing, the, you know, these people, this ability to, you know, better target your marketing campaign, better understand the performance of your system all through your ability to run and manage uh, kind of a modern big data uh, information management system. And so what we're trying to do is take all of that great new innovation that's happening specifically around the, the entire Hadoop infrastructure and ecosystem and bring that in with some of the uh, existing systems that we've had so that we can really make a, a platform that spans from big data to interactive query to structured data to unstructured data to data of all kinds. And so it really doesn't feel like you have islands of different types of data and you need to have uh, kind of expertise across different tool chains depending upon the size or type of data. What we're really trying to do is build a comprehensive platform that lets you work with data of the size that you need, the shape that you need, um, and kind of manage and enrich all of that, bring it towards your, uh, towards your insight platforms. And so that's kind of our big picture on how we're thinking about it. Um, the ways that we're getting there, as I mentioned, is um, we're, at, we're fully embracing Hadoop and its platform uh, and the surrounding projects. And so we're really excited to be participating in that ecosystem um, and seeing all the new innovation that comes online. Uh, as part of that, um, 
one of the interesting things that we're doing is we're really thinking about how can we really simplify bringing all of that uh, you know, exceptional innovation in that area along with some of the traditional systems that folks are running, the data warehouse systems, their BI stacks, et cetera, and really simplify bringing these things together, getting them set up, getting you the right set of management tools so it's easy to have these things working on your behalf. A um, couple of main targets for us is one, obviously making sure that we can bring up the uh, modern uh, data infrastructure on, uh, on Windows Server, whether it's virtualized or not, um, as well as up in the cloud. So one of the really exciting things for us is we're seeing um, a lot of interesting use cases for big data in the cloud and a lot of interesting use cases for big data on premise, depending upon the needs of the business. And we're really targeting both of those environments to have kind of a seamless story around um, how and when and where you want to work with, uh, with data processing. So that's a big area for us um, around simplicity. Another piece around simplicity um, is kind of looking at the setup across a range of folks who may want to be working with your big data platform, um, whether that's the IT uh, manager or IT infrastructure group that is setting up you know, uh, Hadoop clusters on somebody's behalf, all the way down to the developer writing the Hive, Pig, MapReduce, how do they quickly get up and running um, with a development cluster on their machine? And so we're really looking at those personas of people who interact with the big data platform and looking at how we can um, provide them tools uh, and, and platform pieces that really make their life simple. So if you're a developer trying to you know, get that next big data solution written on top of a platform, how can we make you set up so you're empowered, ready to go very quickly? What if you're somebody who's trying to contribute to the next interesting Hadoop project? How can we get you in, into a, a setup very quickly so that you can help kind of push the, uh, push the ecosystem along? Um, so we're really looking across the board from IT all the way through to developer uh, and how we can simplify setup and management of that infrastructure. Um, so that's kind of a big piece of, uh, of how we're thinking about uh, simplicity and across the board um, where we're targeting some of that. The next piece uh, kind of in, uh, in some of the kind of investment and exploration that we've been doing around, uh, around a comprehensive big data platform has been uh, around the developer space. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, the platform and the Hadoop area has grown up, um, there's been some great uh, enrichment across the wide range of projects out there. Um, but one of the things we're, we see is that th there is a need to going to bring the developer tools along so that all of those interesting projects can be used kind of from the environment of choice so that you don't feel like you have to learn a new language or a new set of developer tools to get up to speed um, with some of these new big data solutions. And so one of the things we've been looking at is how can we extend the reach of Hadoop and its related projects so that you know, if you're a web developer, um, you can walk up and be productive uh, fairly quickly. And so we've been looking at how can we integrate um, some JavaScript experiences uh, into the overall big data platform so that you can do things like write map and reduce in, uh, in JavaScript. Uh, other things we've been doing is, um, especially on Windows, there's a lot of uh, uh, C-sharp, .NET development. And so we're looking at how can we extend the reach uh, to, the, to those developers and how can we provide them a a seamless developer experience, um, both with runtimes and libraries um, that uh, are familiar to somebody who's learning to do, as well as the, the tool chains and IDEs for them to kind of easily work with, debug, iterate, unit test, et cetera, um, your big data solutions. So this is looking at how can we really open up um, the overall ecosystem so that you know, more people, kind of regardless of your development background, um, can get up to speed, can start playing with some of this great innovation that's happening in the overall, uh, overall Hadoop community. Um, so at the conference, we'll show specifically how um, we're, we're, we've been working on making sure we continue to have a great Java developer experience at the same time um, bringing online kind of a first class uh, .NET developer experience and using all of the abstractions that somebody in that platform would be used to. And then some of the uh, exploration we've been doing around JavaScript some of this stuff is further along than others, and so we're eager to hear um, what the overall uh, uh, developer community thinks and 
you know, where are we providing some help and where, uh, where should we look at uh, uh, tweaking our direction to, to better help uh, address the needs of the community. Um, so we've got a couple of sessions there. We'll talk about it in our overall one and we've got a deep dive where we kind of go through um, some of the successes and some of the misses that we've had in trying to uh, provide this kind of uh, uh, developer experiences over top of Hadoop. So we'll look at some of the stuff we've got uh, running already in the cloud um, and talk about where we perceive going uh, in the future down this path. And um, we're looking forward to a great dialogue with uh, the Hadoop developer community uh, at, at Strata uh, down this path. So. Um, it's an area we're pretty excited about. We've started to do a, a fair amount of uh, uh, developing and experimenting, so uh, we're eager to hear uh, how things go. Cool. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. I uh, have a couple questions for you here. Uh, first of all, sure. selfishly myself, uh, you said what works and what doesn't work. Can you give me an example of, of a misstep uh, in working with big data that's happened to you along the way? Yeah, so uh, it, it's interesting. Um, when you're building out uh, development tools on top of this stuff, the, the first thing you want to do is make sure that, um, you know, you're not building some proprietary channel between yourself and your cluster. Um, and so as we were, uh, sorry, when I say yourself, I mean our, our tools and, and the cluster, we really want uh, the tool to work over top of, you know, anybody to do cluster. And so some of the missteps we had at the gate was just understanding what is the, um, the best way to remotely interact with a cluster and figure out, you know, where is there a, a project that's pushing a, a REST API that we can get behind and help out on, or what is the best way to really get at or certain types of data or submit certain types of jobs. So uh, early on when we were building our JavaScript console, we were iterating a lot on what is the right pipe into the cluster so that um, we could get the experience we were after, but at the same time, uh, was fairly interoperable with, uh, uh, with a set of uh, you know, what everyone else was doing in the, in the space. So uh, we've been uh, kind of eager observers and, and started to become more active participants around kind of the whole area of open APIs around the cluster because I think that's something that kind of in its infancy a little bit uh, in the Hadoop space and something that um, really kind of opens up opportunities around uh, developer tools and IW tools, et cetera. So some of our missteps early on we're just trying to navigate and understand where the right places to plug in and, and, and how. Um, I'd also say some of our missteps were uh, looking at what's the right interaction pattern people want to have or people expect to have around uh, a big data job that might run for a day and a half. Sure. Uh, right, what's the right UX metaphor? What's the right developer metaphor uh, to surface up? And uh, we've had a few that uh, <laughs> clearly didn't hit the mark. <laughs> No, I think, you know, the, the if you look at things like uh, HTTP, which is sort of not the most optimal thing, but it's darn good and very easy to extend, and now you're seeing uh, attempts like Speedy to make that more efficient, or, or I would even argue, you know, Ajax, which came from a an Internet Explorer plugin that was that, that created the interactive web, and it was sort of proprietary, but wound up being open and just what the world needed. So there's always that line to walk between um, too much of a, a closed environment versus something that's so open it's definitely inefficient and uh, certainly that's finding that, that balance is tough. And then looking at how do we connect some of our, you know, our traditional tools that we work in um, and have all kinds of ways to connect to data sources today, how do we make those things come together in a way that, you know, work reasonably well or pretty well with big data sources? Because a lot of them were built not necessarily with terabytes and petabytes in mind. Um, sure. They were built with a much more interactive uh, scheme in mind, and so we've been looking at how do we bridge those gaps so that, like, like you were saying earlier, a lot of our, uh, our you know, existing tool chain can be lit up with this additional insight from a larger set of data uh, without completely compromising the user experience. Sure. Um, it sounds like client-server all over again, right, when we move the, yep. the, the two across the WAN link, everything broke. Uh, one last quick question for you. Uh, obviously, Excel is the poster child for people accessing data, uh, but SharePoint is usually a pretty common uh, in enterprise tool for sharing information, and uh, John McGrath in the, in the chat room was asking uh, if there are any use cases mapping big data to SharePoint. Yeah, uh, good, good question. Thanks for that. Um, so absolutely, um, SharePoint being one of our uh, main collaboration uh, 
uh, pieces of software on Windows. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is kind of a direct uh, correlation between Excel and some of the self-service analytics that we've been doing in Excel and integration with SharePoint. So some of the stuff that actually is already there today that you can do is kind of consume uh, results of, uh, you know, Hive queries or whatever it might be directly into Excel um, and then host that Excel file up into SharePoint for sharing. Uh, we also have integration inside of SharePoint so that if you want that result set in your Excel document to be refreshed on a fixed cadence or whatnot, um, it's actually built into SharePoint so it'll kind of refresh itself on your behalf on a policy that you, uh, that you predefine. And so we've been working on this kind of data acquisition, data sharing, data visualization arc um, where you acquire into Excel, build your visualization or your pivot chart or um, your power view, whatever it is that you want to build inside of Excel, you share through SharePoint, and then obviously you want that to remain fresh. You want that data to remain relevant. And so you want the SharePoint engine to be able to refresh that artifact on, uh, on some cadence. And that's, that's kind of an arc we've been working through um, that actually works fairly well today. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. I remember when we were first able to drag PowerPoint files into um, Outlook, and the first time I could drag a file to my email, I started doing it a lot, and so did everyone else. And then all of a sudden, the system didn't freak out because the mail server had a five-hour-long queue. So sometimes making things really easy for users to do means that they don't know just how much is being is going on behind the scenes when that happens. How are you guys mitigating that? I mean, how are you, how are you as you vulgarize this stuff, how are you making sure that dumb people don't do dumb things? Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's always a tough challenge in terms of um, how much do you let them do versus how much do you inform them, that kind of fun stuff. Um, and that, that's where I think our kind of back-end, at least talking about the, the arc we were just talking about, to use a concrete example, that's where I think um, some of the interesting work that we've done integrating into the SharePoint backend is where, um, you know, you can go, you can share, um, and we don't push a lot of the work, uh, a lot of the heavy lifting doesn't happen inside of the overall user experience. It happens kind of in the back end on a, on a time cadence when, you know, the server isn't under load, et cetera so that um, the data remains fresh, but it doesn't kind of get in the way of the overall experience. And the reason for integrating um, people understand when they're sharing these artifacts around, um, they're not you know, asking each other to each independently run uh, another big data query to get the, get the results set. Because you know, it would be so easy to share one of these things over email and then everybody goes to refresh, you know, uh, between nine to five and tries to kick off the same large job. And so by being able to take some of that away and kind of shift it um, and using SharePoint as that central kind of sharing artifact, it's one way we uh, are able to kind of address the overall experience without um, needing to, you know, put so much in your face that you have to understand all the concepts of what's happening. All right, good point. Um, and yes, as Robert pointed out, dumb people dumb, doing dumb things. I think everybody does dumb things. The whole point of, uh, of um, trying to vulgarize this technology and democratize it is to make people able to do cool things without being aware of the back end. And, exactly. Uh, and, and it's really that issue. You know, the, the average email sender wasn't, uh, wasn't really aware of the, the size of an email queue. Um, Okay, so uh, we're at the end of our time here. Uh, I think there was a thank you very much, um, Mike, for filling in for Sean at the last minute and uh, giving us an, uh, a pr perspective on what you guys are up to. Um, and I think we did an okay job today covering a broad range of things because, as you can see, uh, we're talking about end user case studies from all sorts of things, from baseball to housing. And we're talking about the ethical sides of, of uh, data and privacy. Uh, we're talking about um, visualization, communication, bringing this stuff to other people through new tool chains. Uh, bring into them made by making the communication between the data creator and the designer um, better. And this is really where we want Strata to go. We see a lot of our time focused on trying to get these two um, worlds of, of data science and society or data science and the average person who doesn't necessarily have a technical background to get closer and closer together. Um, what fascinates all of us uh, here at O'Reilly is the way in which um, the convergence of technology and humanity um, is leading to unexpected 
consequences, uh, changing the way we live, love, work, play, uh, and really just, just transforming what it means to be human. And, and while that might sound a little highbrow, uh, some of the case studies and the examples that I've seen recently uh, suggest that our smartphone today is our prosthetic brain tomorrow, and the neurons of today are the big data of tomorrow. So uh, thank you for joining me uh, as we look at some of this stuff. Uh, hopefully we'll see you in uh, Strata in New York in a couple of weeks. Um, that's happening October 23rd to 25th. And if you go look in the chat, um, Yasmina has um, put in a couple of examples of um, uh, some links that you might want to get. If you're thinking of coming to Strata, uh, you can get 20% off by booking the ticket there using the OLC10 code. Um, if you want to go buy a book, you can do that online uh, at a discount. And uh, finally, we do have a survey that we'd love you to take. Uh, we do take the data for these events very seriously and try to figure out what topics to cover in the future, uh, what worked, what didn't. So if you want to take that survey, Yasmina has pushed the URL uh, to your screen right now. We'd really appreciate a moment of your time to let us know uh, what we're doing right, what we're doing badly, and what you'd like to see in the future. So on behalf of all the speakers and the O'Reilly team, we hope to see you in New York, and thank you all very much for joining us.